Hello audience, in this video we're going to get started on the interior. Yep, we're finally going to get started on the interior. Now for this car I'm going to make the entire thing in-house as opposed to buying a ready-made kit for a few reasons. One is I've had very bad experiences with interior kits. Now like I mentioned when putting the wood together, you really can't make a perfect fitting interior without making patterns of the car it's going in. Not the type of car it's going in, the actual specific car. Because there's a lot of little differences with every car. The other reason is, as you probably guessed by now, this is not going to be an all stock interior. It's going to be a little different here and there, so it's not really something you can order in the first place. The 3031 Ford or sedans had a variety of interiors ever used originally but most commonly there were two and most commonly used today with restorations there's the same two. Now one of them is this. This is brown check cloth. This was commonly used on the base models where the seats would be done in this. The panels and the headliner would be a solid color material that kind of matched this and it would have rubber floor mats. The other one is this. This is brown mohair, which was commonly used on the deluxe models. And this would be used with a wool square weave carpet. Now both of these interiors would be trimmed with something like this. This is coach lace. This is what you pretty much make all the trim out of. Like this is edge welt, made in the same material. This is a piece of wind lace, different grain, but same thing. Is a piece of wire on trim. Now, this is a piece of what this car had in it currently. This is also some kind of brown mohair. I can't tell if it started out as gold or brown or what. You may notice there's quite a difference between these two pieces. This is probably just whatever somebody could get in the late 60s or 70s, I'm guessing. This, I actually matched it off an original interior for a 31 Deluxe Coupe, so this color and this grain, I know for a fact, was used originally by Ford. There may be others, but at least this one was. Now, like I said, there are several other interiors that were used, like Bedford Cord, and in fact, sometime during 31, artificial leather became an option on the Ford or sedans. But once again, if you want to know more, refer to the judging standards. Now we're not using any of this for this car. The owner wants to go in kind of a different direction. We're going to make a custom interior in black and gray leather. This is going to be kind of an updated interior that's going to look a little more in style today, but it's going to be done in traditional techniques so it'll look like it came that way. I'll explain more about that as we go along. So here's the back seat, which as you can tell I've already finished. And it's pretty much just a stock seat with different material. It's done entirely in black leather. We've got the traditional pleats. Now, on some of these four-door sedans, the pleats actually go all the way down the front. And some, they actually have a separate panel here like this. I chose to do it this way because it's a little more like the way the open cars were done. It looks a little more sporty that way. Now, these individual pleats... They appear to have been done for style, but actually, the reason Ford favored this technique is because it's more efficient use of the textiles. Like for example, whatever material you're using, if you cut it into a bunch of little strips, you can get more out of it than if you make the entire seat face out of one piece. And that's an even bigger concern when you're working with leather, because unlike most textiles where you just buy it by the yard, this, you buy it by the hide, and not all of it is usable. So, if you're trying to cover the entire seat with one panel, and if it's got a little flaw here, you can't use it. But this, you can just trim that piece out and sew it back together. This bottom cushion, for example, has five different pieces in it. But you can't tell, because the seams are all hidden between the pleats. So it's very efficient and stylish. And next I'm going to completely upholster the front seat. Now, this is a very slow and time-consuming process, so there's going to be a lot of time lapse in this video. This is my sewing machine. This is what I use for heavy-duty upholstery. 
It's an old singer. I don't know much about it. The last guy who worked on it said it was probably built in the 50s. It's very basic. It stitches in one direction with one pattern. It doesn't have any fancy features or anything. It's pretty much the bare essentials. And it gets the job done. So now I'm going to go through the process that I do to completely upholster one seat. Now in doing so I'm going to go over how these were done originally, how I do it, and the common mistakes I've seen from others. Now starting off, we need a heavy duty material to go over the springs so that the padding doesn't get stuck in between the springs or the springs don't tear holes in anything. And the original choice was burlap which is what I'm going to use on this because it's cheap and effective. And then I'll pull it rather snug and just attach it every so often with hog rings. Next we need a layer of padding on this. Now originally they had about an inch thick layer of natural cotton padding but I'm going to use this. This is an inch thick layer of foam rubber. Now I'll point out that there's a huge difference between natural cotton and foam rubber. It's not a direct replacement. It is noticeable when the job is done and it even mentions it in the judging standards. And I'm somewhat of a nerd for authenticity, so why am I doing this? Well, there's a few reasons. Well, one is, even though natural cotton batting is still available, it's not that easy to get because of its highly limited market. So, unless it's really necessary, I just don't even bother. Like, unless you're building a blue ribbon car or something like that, I'll just use this instead. Another big reason is, today's audience, they're more accustomed to modern day car seats which are padded entirely with foam rubber. So. Going for a more authentic feeling on this is not really worth it. However, either way it'll work. Now, the big problem I've seen people do with this is they heavily over pad the seats. Now, as I pointed out, there's just a layer of burlap under here. We have an inch thick layer of foam rubber, and that's it. The springs underneath, they do all the suspension, they do the cushion effect, they are pretty much the seat. This is just a layer of padding to equalize the top of it. And then it's going to get a little more padding for the pleats and all that, and that's it. I cannot believe how commonplace it is for people to over pad the seats. And in their defense, it doesn't help that most interior kits come with way too much padding and recommend using all of it. The few interior kits I've installed, I've removed probably about half the padding they come with and not even use it. With that done, I now have the final outer dimensions of the seat, which means I can finish working on the seat face. Okay, it's a few days later, and here it is. Done, ready to go. Now it's currently turned inside out right now, 
what we're going to do is align the center. I've marked the center on both of these. And then align the edge welt, which I want it to land right about on this corner, on this edge here, maybe a little below it. So get that about right and then carefully turn all of this out. Then we'll flip it over and start tacking it down. Now tacking this down is a slow, steady process. It's going to take a lot of adjusting. I'm probably going to spend a few hours on this thing getting it looking just right. Now if you're wondering how these were done originally, what they would do is the entire seat assembly like this, upside down, would go in a press. That would actually, that was about the same size as the seat. It would compress it down to where it was the right height and the springs were properly tensioned, which is another good point I'd like to point out is these springs are supposed to be under a slight tension. It's one thing a lot of upholsters never do is they just they just put this on, nail it on wherever it looks good and that's it, but these springs actually have to be compressed to a certain point. It makes them a little less bouncy, but I mean they'll work even if you don't. And when they were under compression someone with a hammer and nails would just go around nail it all around once and when it came out it would be inspected and if it passed it would go on a production car. And most of them came out decent but a lot of them had some serious flaws in them because let's face it it's a cheap mass-produced car it's not gonna have the greatest workmanship but I'm gonna put some time into this thing and get it to fit as good as I can. Well, been fussing with this for a few days now and it's looking okay, so I'm going to put this aside and get to work on the backrest. So now we're going to start covering the back of the front seat carriage. As you can see, I've already put a few layers of batting on it just to smooth it out, make it a little softer. And covering it with the same material we're using on the seat faces. Now there's no tack strip on the back, so I'm going to glue it on there to start with and then just start pulling it and stapling it on, starting with the center, working my way out.
Now we're going to install the backrest. Now this was done pretty much the same way as the bottom cushion except for the top of it which gets nailed on after it's installed. And I'm doing this with the bottom cushion installed because I want to line up the pleats. Now we're going to nail the top of the backrest on. And I'd like to point out that this burlap that I covered the springs with on the top, instead of attaching it to the springs, I actually nailed it to the back of the seat carriage. Now the reason I did that is so it'll hold padding on top of it. Because when you nail the backrest on, usually there's a line right here, right about where the springs are, and it makes a harsh line between the side and the top. Now I like it to be more of a round transition and the way to do that is to add a lot of padding to the top here but without something on the back to hold it it'll just fall into the springs. So this is how I do it. Probably going to need more padding than this. We'll see. And now there's these sides I have to finish. Now normally these are padded and installed before the backrest, but I normally pad them after the backrest is installed because I want to pad them in such a way to where it looks like the backrest is just continuing over the side, like it's another pleat. And you usually end up using a lot of padding in this and it takes a while to fuss with it to get it just right. And that's it for now. There's still a lot of fine touches to do, like the wire on trim that goes around here and a few other little pieces, but I'm going to leave it like this for a week or so and let it all conform, and I might take some of it apart and rework it, maybe get a little better. Maybe not. I'll just wait and see. But for now, I'm going to throw it back in the car until I decide. Well, that's it for now. I really wanted to get the seats done first, as they're the most complicated and most important part of the interior. The rest of it's pretty simple, however, it's probably going to take a while, as there's still a lot of loose ends we need to sort out with this car. However, we're really getting near the end of this project, so it's really getting fun now. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video.